This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to the Condo Insider a program on everything you ever wanted to know about owning, buying, selling a condominium and all the aspects that related to it. I'm your host Scott Shirley and I am pleased to announce today and honored to have as our guest a familiar face here on the Condo Insider, uh, Jane Sugimura, who is the president, and I always get this messed up, the president of the Hawaii Council, Council of, of Association, Association of Apartment Owners. Owners. Yeah. Um, better known as HCCA, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> and she is our guest today. And one of the reasons we have her as our guest today is because of the issue of the fire sprinklers in the condominiums. We just had a board meeting last week where we were discussing some aspects. And both Richard and Emery and I thought it would be appropriate time to have you on again um, to discuss the issues that are coming up at at least the county council in regards to the mandate on sprinkler systems. Right. So I'm letting you loose. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the fire, uh, the, the, the residential fire safety um, advisory committee released its report uh, yesterday to the city council and I've got it right here. It's, it's a big fat report, and it's online. It's a it, and so it's public. Uh, I understand it's on the city council website. So anybody who wants to look at it, it is there. And I got that in email today, and I haven't even finished reading through it. So right. <laughs> it's a and lot so of pages. this is yeah. This is the, the recommendation of the committee to the city council, and this is in connection with uh, Mayor Caldwell's uh, Bill 69. And that bill called for mandatory retrofitting of all high-rise uh, buildings in, city, in the city and county of Honolulu over 75 feet tall. That's about seven stories, yeah. okay? Now, um, and, he, and that bill called for retrofitting within five years. Within five years, within I remember five years, that, and, yeah. Right, and, and, we, and I and others testified at council hearings saying that number one, that's not doable. You yeah. can't, there's not enough companies in the state of Hawaii to retrofit 361 yeah. buildings uh, in five years. And, and even if there were, I mean, not one of the condominiums on the list, the 361, have any money in their budget to pay for yeah. retrofitting, which costs millions of dollars. And it's like, and, and even if they, you know, and even if they could, I mean, where would they get? Where would they get it? They have to get it from the unit owners, yep. and the unit owners would have to be specially assessed because they they don't have it in their budget, and so it, it and and there's and if they had to go out and borrow the money, there aren't enough banks in the state to loan 361 uh, buildings, uh, you know, money to do the retrofitting. So, it, so I think everybody agreed that it was not doable. Doable. And so the committee has come back with some recommendations. Uh, most of which I agree with. I was a member of the panel uh, for Hawaii Council, and um, I agree with a lot of the stuff in the recommendations, and, but I disagree on a really important point, you know, and, and that's what I'm here to talk about. Well, let's go back to the, the, the five-year issue. I remember when that came up about having to be done within five years, and, and a lot of us knew immediately that was not doable. Um, but Richard Emery had done some research and looked at other states that had mandated, and one state had mandated five years, and 15 years later, they're still doing it. So it proved a point that you cannot do it in five years. Is that still in the, uh, no. the bill, or no. is that taken out? No, the, yeah, that was taken out. Uh, the bill now calls for compliance, which means compliance with this, uh, the retrofitting requirement, because it does start off with the premise that all buildings subject to the act shall be retrofitted mm -hmm. with sprinklers. But now you have 12 years to comply. Okay. Okay, but let me just get to the, the, the point that the report, uh, recommendations that the report uh, makes. It starts with the premise that all buildings have to be retrofitted, except if you come under an exemption. Okay. okay, so you start with number one, everybody has to be retrofitted if you're over 75 feet tall, okay? The first exemption, if you have no interior corridor, then you're, no matter how high your building is, no matter how large your building is, you're exempt from the, uh, the, the retrofitting 
requirement. Mm -hmm. If your building is 10 stories or less than 10 stories, which means if it's eight or nine stories, even if it has an interior corridor, you're exempt, yeah. okay? So in the report, the th there are the list, there's a list of 361 buildings, and in column J, there's an item that says interior corridor, and a, a, and a Y for a yes, and an N for a no. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at it, about 210 buildings have no interior corridors, are below 10 stories, so you've, they're exempt. Okay. That leaves about 150 buildings that are now subject to the uh, possible retrofitting. And uh, what the recommendation is, is that all buildings, including the exempt ones, have to go through this life safety evaluation. And this is something, uh, this is a process that was not created by anybody here locally. It was created on the mainland. Uh, we, uh, I don't know what jurisdiction came up with it, but it is, has been adopted by the National Fire Safety Association, mm -hmm. and it's recognized by you know international uh, building code organizations. And what it does, it's a process by which you examine the building to determine if it's safe. And they look at certain factors. Some factors you can change and some factors you yeah. can't. One factor you can't change is how big is the building, right? <laughs> is it 10 stories? Is it 20 stories? Is it 40 stories? The taller the building, the more dangerous it is. In other words, it, it takes you longer to get people out of the building, and, it takes, and it's harder for firefighters to get into yep. the building and fight the fire. So how tall a building is uh, affects the safety. Another thing is compartmentalization. In other words, if a fire starts in, a, in an apartment unit, will it be contained in that, apart, in that unit or will it spread? Okay, so they, you look at your walls. Are they concrete? Are they masonry? Are they drywall? Mm -hmm. If they're concrete, and you know, then you know, it, it, it gets a higher point. If it's drywall, it gets a lower point yeah. because it's more dangerous because the, the, the possibility of the fire getting through that wall are greater if it's, if it's not concrete or masonry. And another thing is, uh, you know, buildings have these vertical openings, you know, like where you put a pipe or a conduit yep. and it goes up through the floors, right? And when the building is built, because the hole that, you know, the boring that you make to put in the pipe or the conduit is not the same size, you have to fill in the hole, the opening. And after 30, 40 years, like most of these buildings are, that seal goes away or deteriorates. Deteriorates, yes. And now you have a hole. It's called a vertical <laughs> opening, right? And, and so if you have vertical openings that have, where the seal has gone away, that means if you have a fire, it's going to travel through that travel opening. Travel through those holes, yeah. To get to the higher upper floors. And so that makes your building riskier. And, it, and um, also, you know, what this uh, uh, life safety evaluation looks at is your elevator uh, system and your alarm system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and most uh, condos have elevator renovations in their budget now. And if you, uh, and, and most, a lot of them have not done it, mainly yeah. because it's a huge item. It's over a million dollars. And so they've been putting it off or, but you know, every building that I know that, that is a high rise has money socked away for yeah, elevators. For elevators. For yeah. elevator renovations. If they renovate those elevators, they gotta bring everything up to code, including the alarm system. And that means that your elevator will talk to your alarm system, your alarm system will talk to your smoke detectors, and you know, everything works together. They're all talking to each other. Right now they're not. And a lot of buildings, because you know, they're old, they're kind of jury rigged, you know, your part breaks and so yeah. they put in a part here and, it's, and they may, it may not be the right part, but it's all jury rigging. And so now if they have to, you know, uh, upgrade their, uh, uh, renovate their elevators, they're gonna have to upgrade everything else. And that would, in a life safety evaluation, that would give them more points. And also what, what is in the life safety evaluation is they wanna know, how you get out of the building. Like if, if you're in a building and you have to get out, do you have two exits? Do you have a stairwell on both mm -hmm. sides? Yeah. And how far is it? Is it 50 feet? If it's 50 feet for you to get from your place to the stairwell to get out of the building, that means you would get plus points. If it's 200 feet and it takes you longer, that's more dangerous, 
that would give you minus points. You know, when we were discussing that aspect um, last week, I was thinking of the old building that I used to live in. Uh, granted, it was on Maui, but we actually had three fire exits, one in the middle and one at either end of the building. What made it more interesting? Half the building was exterior hallways, and the other half was interior hallways. I wonder how they would handle something like that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean... <laughs> They would have to make an adjustment, yeah. but you, you know. Part of the building passes, part of it doesn't. You yeah, know. <laughs> part of it is exempt, right? And, but you know, I mean, and this is the kinds of things they look at. Yeah. And you can see how some things you can't change because of the structure of the building, you can't change it. Yeah. There are other things you can change. Like you can install smoke detectors, you can upgrade your fire alarm system, you can upgrade your, your elevators, you can f fill in the holes around your vertical openings. And uh, another thing is they want to they wanna know what kind of doors you have. Yes. You have solid doors. Uh, we heard at the Marco Polo they had louver doors. I don't know what that means, but I guess that's holes in the doorway. And that was not permitted unless that's a second door, unless you have a fire door and a second door was a louver door. Actually, I know of an association where a friend of mine lived, and that's what, exactly what they had. They had a sliding pocket door of a louver door, so they could open their regular door and then slide that um, louver door so they could get ventilation through. Mm -hmm. And to me, that, especially after Marco Polo, it made me more aware of how dangerous that might be if you have a fire in your unit, it can go right out that door. Right, and, and another thing with the door is you have to have a closer. A closer is that metal thing on top of the door mm -hmm. that makes it close automatically. Yep. And, so, and so if you don't have them, then that association can put closers on their unit doors because that will give them plus points because that's what's required under the life safety evaluation in the matrix that we'll talk about later on. Yeah. So, if, you know, so first of all, you have solid wood doors that are, you know, that are fire rated, and I think it's 30 minutes or something like that. And then in the corridor, where, you know, in, in the public areas of the building, the fire rating is on the door jam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, seal, it's, it's, it's somehow fixed. I don't know whether it's glued or, or screwed in, but there's a plate. I've seen it. Mm -hmm. I have as well, yes. yeah. And so, uh, so it's in the door jam, and that will tell you how long that d door is rated. So, so these are things that the inspectors will be looking for. And, and, so, and so if you don't have the, the cor correct doors, you can replace them. It's cheaper than doing retrofitting. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. See, so these are, these, these are things, you know, that uh, I think are important. And that's why I think, you know, it, 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 adopting the life safety evaluation for all high-rise buildings is a good thing for uh, the city to, you know, uh, adopt. And that way, all the buildings would go through the, 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 the process and be evaluated, and they can see where they're deficient, and then they can do their you know, upgrading or replacement or fixing and, and bring everything up to uh, increase their score. And I agree with you on that. I think this is uh, an important aspect for the boards at these associations and the owners to have something that they can actually look at and go around their building, not just um, the issues that have been popping up, but it'll help them in the long run as well, mm -hmm. um, budgeting-wise as well. Right. Yeah. And and you know the the the, the boogeyman in in the back room <laughs> is if you don't do this, yeah. you're going to do retrofitting. <laughs> you know, retrofitting is and retrofitting means millions of dollars, yeah. and special assessments and all those bad things. And and I think you know most buildings you know would prefer not to do that. Uh, and and if they only you know, and, and, and this is a process that allows them to have their buildings inspected, and it's going to be a standard form. Mm -hmm. So that means that you know your building is going to be evaluated in the same matrix yep. as my building, and and you know and the people who will be doing it would be uh, uh, professional engineers and architects, and they will be given free training by the city. And the good thing about it is is the matrix that they use to the tool that they use to actually, you know, record the measurements of all, you know, the values of all these things has been prepared by the city. It's going to be part of the ordinance, so that means that the people who do the inspections have, have to, to use yeah. have to use this form and it's going to be given to the inspectors for free. Oh, that's wonderful. It's going to be free. Yeah. So that means that the unit owner, the associations are not paying for software. I mean, when they when the inspectors come to their projects, to do the inspection, the associations will only be paying for their hour, the professional time that the inspectors yep. spend 
doing the, you know, the evaluation. Well, that's good information, and we're going to take a quick uh, break, and then when we come back, we'll continue on with the issue of retrofitting, et cetera. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Greetings, it's me, Angus McTech, the longtime host and star of Hibachi Talk. Think Tech is important to our community because we bring all kinds of cool ideas and I bring gadgets to the, to the show. So you gotta watch it for sure. But for the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech. We'll run only during the month of November and you can help. Please donate what you can that Think Tech in Hawaii can continue to be public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming like mine. And I'm in charge. I've already made my donation, and it's really hard to get the Scotsman to make a donation, but I already did. Please send in your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website, thanksforthinktech.cosbox.com. Say that three times fast. Closing, on behalf of the community enriched by Think Tech, Hawaii's 30 plus weekly shows, thank you, and we're mahalo for watching Think Tech and your gen generosity. Let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha. Welcome back to the Condo Insider. I'm here with my guest, um, Jane Sugimura, and we've been discussing uh, basically the county bill in regards to retrofitting of sprinklers and things like that. And it's amazing how much time flies, so I wanna make sure that in the last section of this program, you have the opportunity to go over a lot of what we've discussed in some of our meetings over the last week or so, and so I'm throwing it right back at you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you know, uh, and in fact, um, if we can have the matrix, I, th I, we, I, do we, can we have the matrix shown? Yeah, th there this is a matrix. This is a matrix that all of the inspectors, you know, will be using to uh, inspect the buildings. And as you can see, it's, it's a spreadsheet. It's an Excel spreadsheet. And the values that are on the spreadsheet, you know, can change. And this is, you know, something that will probably be debated in the hearings. And by the way, there is a hearing on Tuesday, November 14th, uh, before the legal, ma I mean, the um, Executive Matters and Legal Affairs Committee of the City Council. And that's at Honolulu Holly on the second floor committee room at one o'clock. And they will be uh, debating and considering testimony on changes to Mayor Caldwell's Bill 69. And one of the issues is going to be whether or not to adopt the uh, Residential Fire Safety Advisory Committee's recommendation, which means a life safety evaluation, this matrix that's on the screen now, uh, that will be used uh, to evaluate all the buildings. And there are values in here, you know, for uh, different things like, you know, if your building is, is tall, you know, it's going to have a uh, minus point mm -hmm. if you have, and, 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 and what, there's one issue here, they, there's a, a value for um, sprinklers. Of course, nobody's got sprinklers. <laughs> and, you know, my position is, well, why is it a minus five? Because it's not required by law now, and it will be required if this bill is passed. But right now, to give it a minus five seems to me to, you know, put the... 150 buildings that you know are that might have to do retrofitting, uh, you know, at a disadvantage. You can start off with a minus five. You're being punished for something that isn't required yet. Right. So <laughs> I, you know, so I said, if you want to make it a, you know, a, you know, a detriment, you know, it should be a zero or a minus one, not yeah. a minus five. And 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 you know, and I I. I and, but, the, but the thing of it is, is that it, it turns out that if you read the report, and it's, I think sometimes it's when they submit these reports and they make it really thick like this and add all these pages, it's because they don't want anybody to read and understand what's happening. And, if you, and the bottom line is, is that the 150 buildings that you know, have an interior corridor and are over 10 stories, 10 stories or over, they can't pass a life safety evaluation without doing partial retrofit. Exactly. I mean, after you get through all the report and, and, and all the comments, that's what's going to be recommended. 
and that's what I have a problem with. I, you know, uh, uh, you know, my 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 issue is, you know, I, I think going through the life safety evaluation for all buildings is a good thing. Exactly. So it, because it, then it allows a professional to look at the you know matrix and go through the building and and score you know what it, what he sees in the building, and. And that gives, you know, the association an evaluation of how safe their building is, you know, and, and they can make adjustments. And to me, if you can make adjustments, like you can improve your elevator, uh, uh, if you can do the elevator renovations and, you know, uh, upgrade your fire alarm systems, fill in the, uh, you know, the uh, vertical openings and put in uh, smoke detectors in, and, and, and this, in this, uh, matrix, they're requiring a smoke detector in every bedroom and in the hallways leading to the bedroom. And yeah. if they're in tandem, it's more points. And this is this is a higher requirement that's currently required by the city ordinance, mm -hmm. yeah. which only requires one smoke detector in a condominium. And so, um, you know, so you know, my my feeling is is that you know, if if you can get a passing score. By doing these, you know, upgrading and correcting things that are wrong with your building, that you should not have to do retrofitting. And if you want to do retrofitting, this, the new ordinance, the new uh, suggested revisions will allow you to do it because you have 12 years. And if you need more time, and let's say, you know, you've you've got it in your budget and you've got minutes to say that you're considering the retrofitting, you go out and you you know you get a proposal and you need more time, the city will give you more time. They will give you up to 20 years to comply. I mean, it doesn't say so in the statute, but it, you know, if you, you get to 12 years and you want to do retrofitting and you still need a couple of years to do it, the city will give it to you. They won't ding you because you haven't finished it in 12 years. Well, the other thing I noticed too is, is there's no magic number, number one, because even in the interview that your telephone interview you did on the news last night, they were pointing out that it would cost approximately this much for this building, this much for this building, and those are actually just estimates. Yes. No. Yeah. yeah nobody knows until you go in, and because you know there's a, the issue of uh, asbestos removal, yep. and and one thing that came up on the last day of our our committee hearings is that if you want to do retrofitting, you need at least the minimum. There's this huge pump that you need, you know, to get the the water from the ground up through yep. your you know hallways and in order to do that you need at a minimum at least 10 by 10 a room that's 10 yep. by 10 to fit this pump that needs to drive the water up and if you don't have a 10 by 10 room that means that you have to add another room to your existing condominium which raises a whole you know people who live in condominium that raises a whole new you know bunch of issues like you get you need to get you know uh, a majority uh, consent of your unit owners yeah. to add to the common elements and and one of the the engineers who are part of the committee said you know in downtown buildings they maxed out yeah they don't they, have any they room. don't have any room so now if you're going to require them to put in a 10 by 10 room then they're going to have to come back to the city for a variance. Well, I know you and I joked about the fact, well, they're going to have to kick the resident manager out of the <laughs> resident manager's unit and put the pump room in there. <laughs> right. Right. But again, it's, it's sort of like the way I've taught legislation over the years. There's always unintended consequences. Right. But you don't see those at the beginning. You see that as you get into this, and just like you have pointed out and, and has shared with us today, there are certain things that are popping up in the bill that you you never even thought of when this first started out. Right, and um, and and right now it's it's really important, you know, because you know if if there are people out there who live in these 150 buildings that may have to do retrofitting, if they don't want to do retrofitting, now's the time to speak up. And I, I and if you can post that list of um, city council members, there, there, it is. there, there it is. Okay, the city council members. Those are your city council members, and if you live in any of their districts, those are their telephone numbers. You pick up the phone and you call them, and you won't be able to talk to the council members because they're going to be busy, but you're going to be able to talk to a staff member. And the mis message is, I live in council member 
so-and-so's district. I'm a constituent and I vote. And I'm calling about Bill 69. And I don't like retrofitting. That's all you have to say. And they may ask you for your name. And, and so you give them their, and, and then you can hang up. But then you're, you're, you will be registered. They, I, I promise you they will make sure that, you know, the council member knows that, you know, they have gotten a call from a constituent who is very upset about Bill 69. It's going to be heard on Tuesday. And, uh, and all of the council members, all of these council members listed on the screen now are members of that committee, the um, Executive Matters and Legal Affairs Committee that will be meeting on Tuesday, uh, January 14th at 1 o'clock. And, um, and I'm hoping that when we go, and I will be there at the hearing to testify uh, for flexibility in the statute. In other words, I'm going to be testifying that, that when the buildings get, go through their life safety evaluation, that they be allowed to improve their building or, and, or upgrade their uh, fire safety systems or do other things in order to get a passing score and that they don't have to do uh, a retrofitting unless they choose to do it. And I think it's, it's important that the, the buildings have that flexibility because uh, only the buildings know uh, how willing their residents are or their owners are to pay for retrofitting and, and so, some buildings, you know, may want to do it and some buildings may not. And so they should, it should be something that is determined by the buildings and not by the government. Well, you know, the situation at the Marco Polo was a, a very sad situation. But one of the things that I've noticed with a number of uh, associations now is it made them reevaluate what is their uh, plans in case of an emergency like this. and. and Actually, some of them are talking about finally doing the fire drill that they've never done. Right. Um, so there, it's the old saying: "There's always a silver lining." Um, but uh, I think the work you've been doing, especially um, that I've seen in the last uh, several weeks, it's amazing how much you've done and how much has already been accomplished on modifying this bill, and it's not done yet. No, it's not done. <laughs> it's not done, and we've got a long ways to go, and like I said, you know, every voice counts, and so, you know, you may think you, you, you can't do anything, but if everybody who is upset about this will pick up their phone and call their council member, that's all it takes is a that's phone call. That's all it takes. All it takes is a phone call. And so I'm, I'm hoping that the message will get out, and the people who are affected will realize that, you know, they're taxpayers. Mm -hmm. They put these people into office uh, to determine policy. And, and yes, the mayor is an important elected official, but he's only one elected official. Yep. He's, there are nine council members out there, and they are waiting to hear from their constituents. Well, as usual, 30 minutes just flies by, especially on a subject like this. So first off, I'd like to thank you again for being our guest. I really appreciate you coming in because I know how hectic your schedule is, especially with this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to thank all of our viewers for watching us here on the Condo Insider. And be sure to tune in next Thursday for more on everything you ever wanted to know about condominium living right here on the Condo Insider. Aloha.